Hey guys, so welcome to week five, and uh, this week we're going to talk about some fun concepts in uh, organizational behavior and strategic communication, things like uh, power and politics and decision making and conflict, and what are sometimes considered to be the kind of ugly side of organizational behavior. So I want to enhance a couple of the key concepts in the text and kind of put them into a, a framework for us to think about. The first of those that I want to talk about is different types of power in organizations. When we when we talk about power in organizations, we're often thinking of only a very particular type of power based upon position, and that's certainly a form of, of power that the you know the, the the CEO, the board of directors, the manager of a team, etc., um, has and displays a certain kind of power. But but there's also a more subtle and nuanced use of power that gets granted that any individual can have too. So. Um, let's look at the, the seven different bases of power in organizations. The first of these is coercive power. An individual has power if they have the ability to uh, threaten fear or punishment. Uh, they may be able to um, kind of grant a negative reward or withhold positive rewards. Um, the, the kind of you do this or I'll fire you type of uh, behavior is definitely a kind of coercive power. Reward power is just the opposite. The ability to grant the more positive rewards or withhold negative um, kind of negative situations, negative uh, rewards, as uh, is seen as the ability the ability to grant those positive rewards is known as reward power. Third is legitimate power, the one that typically we think of. I think when we use the word power, that's power based upon position, rank, authority, position in a hierarchy, things like that, kind of officially granted based upon the organization's um, kind of hierarchy generally more true in some of the traditional organization designs that we've looked at based upon some um, rather than the the kind of relational cultural or network organizations that we've studied so it's really interesting as a side note to kind of um, and i'll ask you to do this in our discussions this week to overlay power um, these bases of power on uh, those types of organizations that we've studied the fourth type of power in organizations is known as information power that's concerned with the access to or control over inf information. Who shares information, who owns it, who spreads it, how do they share that with others, how do they you know, grant that, that information um, to others. Generally, people who have that access to or control information have a greater degree of power. Fifth is expert power. Um, known as uh, kind of power that's gained because someone has a special expertise or skill or knowledge. If someone's able to do something that nobody else can do, um, the, the one person in the office who knows how to um, have a certain specialized IT skill or use the certain you know, technology machine, etc., that person has expert power over others. The, uh, the next base of power is called referent power, generally power granted to an individual because uh, people like them, because there's identification, respect, admiration, uh, people like that individual, and so they're, gonna, they're going to either seek to be like them or um, want to please that person, so uh, that person will have referent power. And the final base of power is charisma, charisma or charismatic power, really an extension of referent power stemming from an individual's personality, interpersonal style, somebody who may be able to um, articulate an attractive vision, um, or is sensitive to others. Uh, and, you know, many people, do, even who aren't in formal leadership positions, but who other people really um, like quite a bit and who have that kind of charismatic authority and people gravitate toward them, generally have charismatic power. So let's look at power in, ac uh, power in action. We're going to start to look at uh, politics and dependency. But um, the reason that the, those bases of power really aren't, um, they aren't power, they're potential power. In other words, um, someone who has one of those forms of power only has it um, because other people are dependent on them in essence. The greater that a B's dependency on A, the greater power A has over B. So you power is more of a potential than something that someone just inherently kind of has. So what creates dependency? Um, people are dependent on an individual if what they have is important to someone. So uh, dependency, if nobody wants what you've got, it's not going to create dependency. So if you have something that, uh, that is not uh, important to other people, then 
um, they're not really going to see that the person who controls that is having power. So um, to create dependency, the thing you control must be perceived as being important. The second um, kind of uh, point that, of what creates dependency is scarcity. If something is plentiful, possession of it will increase your power. So a resource needs to be perceived as scarce to create dependency. So again, if you're the only one who knows something or knows how to do something, then um, and, and that resource or knowledge is scarce, then more people will be dependent on you if you have that information. And the last is non-substitutability. Non so the more that a resource has no viable substitutes, the more power that control over that resource provides. So if people can't go elsewhere to get it, you're the only source of it, or it's too expensive or complicated or time consuming to get it, then there's no substitute to get that. So the more likely people would be dependent on the individual who controls that, the greater their power. So again, all those forms of power, again, are just sort of potential, and they kind of raise or lower, they become more um, important, those bases of power become more significant if they, more people are dependent on them, and what creates dependency is importance, scarcity, and non-substitutability. So let's look at power in action, how, um, how power gets exerted in an organization, and that's with political behavior. So the, the idea of politics is really the exercise of power. Politics is defined as those activities that are not required as part of one's formal role in the organization, but that influence or attempt to influence the distribution of advantages and disadvantages in the organization. So people engage in political behavior by doing things like um, withholding key information, perhaps, um, in order to, you know, again, use that power. If somebody has that, that information, they're going to withhold it from someone else in order to uh, use it as a bargaining chip or um, to punish someone else. Perhaps spreading rumors or leaking confidential information internally or externally, lobbying for or against a particular decision. So organizations that have a great deal of political behavior in them, um, you know, often cause a lot of uh, frustration, decrease job satisfaction, they increase anxiety and stress. Highly political organizations tend to have increased turnover, tend to have increased, uh, sorry, reduced individual and organizational performance as well. So what contributes to politics? What, what, um, what are some of the factors that create a political organization? Well, some of those are individual factors. Um, certain characteristics that the psychologists have found about us, uh, we're more likely to engage in, in, in uh, po politics if we have personally a high need for power or what the psychologists call an internal locus of control, meaning um, we want to be able to manipulate our environment in order for us to be successful in it. But it turns out that some of those individual factors really pale in comparison to more of the organizational factors that indicate we're more likely to predict a political environment. Organizations that have a low amount of trust within them are more likely to see more political behavior. If there are limited resources, conflict over resources, or declining resources, if there are layoffs, if there are budget cuts, we're going to be more likely to see politics in that organization. Promotions and competition, certainly unclear performance criteria. If it feels like people get promoted here or they get rewards here based upon um, kind of creating favor with a manager or um, really being the, the sort of manager's favorite, uh, people will be in, more likely to engage in competitive behavior and more likely to, um, to kind of exhibit some destructive political behavior. Role ambiguity also causes political behavior. If roles aren't clear, people are stepping on each other's toes, you know, they're not quite sure um, who's responsible for what, we may be more likely to see in those organizations uh, where roles aren't clear, more political behavior. The culture of the organization also can predict political behavior if people believe that um, there's an internally competitive environment, as we've already seen, if they define um, most decisions by a kind of win-lose or a zero-sum game. You know, every time I win, somebody else has to lose, or, you know, only one of us can win, we can't both win. Um, those organizations will see more more politics. And then certainly, lower down in the organization, folks may be role modeling top leadership behavior. If that top leadership um, also engages in a great deal of political behavior, they may be more likely to do that as well. 
Um, we also read about decision making and conflict, and I just wanted to highlight and put into a framework a couple of things about conflict um, that aren't necessarily included in the chapter as well. So, you know, conflict really comes from the kind of um, um, uh, kind of meeting together at two points of a team's interdependence. Uh, team members that have to work together to resolve their concerns, decisions affect multiple members. The interdependence is important with conflict so that we, you know, particularly in, in teams, individuals have to see that um, decisions that are made affect multiple members and that there must be some kind of differences, meaning people have a difference of opinion, um, a, a difference of roles, values, etc., information, but there's got to be some kind of difference that, that creates conflict so that um, we have to figure this out together and we are interdependent in resolving this. And conflict is often described as, um, as a negative thing. If there's a conflict on a team or in an organization, it's often thought of as something that's harmful. And that's not necessarily the case. I think we, um, we see versions of this in the chapter where they're um, kind of describing um, that some conflict actually can be good, can be healthy. Better decisions can be made because they've been tested through a constructive uh, conflict process. When um, a group comes together and brings the best of that team and the best of members and their expertise, um, a better decision can result when people really engage and, and try to resolve the conflict together. So there's this middle ground between, um, you know, kind of there's this line between constructive and destructive conflict. It's the destructive part we want to avoid, we really want to promote constructive conflict. We don't want to get all the way to the extreme where everyone is just agreeing and um, we're, we're getting to the point of what's been called groupthink or people who don't want to say that they disagree for fear of creating a conflict and avoiding it entirely. So we have this kind of fake artificial harmony. And we don't want to end up on the opposite side either where there's a destructive conflict, people are attacking one another, there's some mean-spirited personal attacks and maybe engaging in some of that destructive political behavior. So it's finding that ideal point that's really important. The, the uh, chapter discussed five different modes of conflict. These actually come from something called the Thomas Kilman Conflict Mode Instrument. Uh, you may have already taken this, or if you're interested, you can look it up online and, uh, and find out which of these kind of style preferences you have when you engage in conflict. But they all differ on a continuum of how assertive you are in participating in the conflict and how cooperative you are with others. So how how kind of engaged roll up your sleeves, how much are you going to really dive in, how assertive are you going to be, and then are you going to be cooperative with others or are you going to see it as more of a competition. So you can see these five different modes that we talked about, um, collaborating, com competing, compromise, accommodating, and avoiding as five different modes of conflict. What's important to mention is that all of all five of these conflict modes, none of them is right or wrong in the abstract. Certainly they're situational. Um, there are times when, for the good of the group, it might be better to for everyone to fully engage and collaborate because it's a really important decision. And there might be times when um, we don't have a lot of time and we have to hurry up and make a decision and maybe accommodating is better. And we need to simply take one person's opinion or, or decision and go with it. So applying these um, is just important. Uh, the, the key point that I wanted to call out in addition to what's in the chapter is just that there's no right or wrong in the abstract of these five modes. So I hope this adds a little bit to our discussion of power politics, decision-making, conflict in organizations, and I'll see you online.